A Long Island, New York couple said today that it was the devil, drugs, and rock and roll that led their son to ritual murder and finally to suicide last week. The teenager reportedly was part of a satanic cult, the Knights of the Black Circle. And as Jennifer McLogan tells us tonight, neighbors are scared that these devil worshipers may take their teen next. The people who live in the quiet harbor village of Northport, Long Island, take pride in their law-abiding ways and small-town traditions. But today they are dumbfounded over revelations about a devil-worshipping cult of teenagers who reportedly performed ritual sacrifices in a local park. It's usually very mellow here. You know, this is that, that's why it was such a shock that it happened. Well, they would build a fire and sit around the fire and, uh, and take a, an animal, a dog usually, and uh, torture it to death. And Last week, two teenagers were charged with the sacrificial slaughter of a third in revenge over the theft of drugs. The victim had been stabbed repeatedly and his eyes gouged out. One of the suspects, 17-year-old Richard Casso, hanged himself Saturday in the Suffolk County Jail. Authorities say he had been in trouble many times. Richard Casso was awaiting trial on a charge of opening a 19th century grave in April and stealing a skull and a hand, purportedly for use in a ritual. He used to make these tapes um, and he would play his guitar and he saves the devil. <laughs> Police blame the cult's existence on drugs and the influence of heavy metal hard rock. Groups like ACDC with a satanic image. Police say a number of misguided lonely teenagers got involved with a cult called Knights of the Black Circle because they wanted recognition. Police are scouring Northport Harbor for the murder weapon and residents of the village are trying to come to grips with what some call the most horrifying tragedy ever to hit their community. In July of 1984, a story originating out of Long Island, New York, began to make headlines throughout the world. That was when the body of 17-year-old Gary Lowers was found in a shallow grave in the Astakia Woods just outside of the sleepy harbor village of Northport. Lauer's body, which had been covered with sticks and leaves, had been badly mutilated beyond what was typically seen in suburban murder cases. He had been stabbed dozens of times, with his eyes gouged out of his head, and had been left to decompose for several weeks. Police only discovered this body after being informed by a local tipster, a teenager that had heard rumors about Gary Lauer's murder, and police began to narrow in on those responsible. As you just heard in the clip from NBC News, the supposed culprit of this murder scheme was another teenager, 17-year-old Ricky Casso, who was arrested alongside Jimmy Troiano, another teen that had been with him at the time of the murder. They, along with Albert Quinones, another teenager that would become a witness for the prosecution, had been under the influence of illicit substances at the time of the murder, and for that reason, their collective judgment and recollection of events would come into question. Regardless, just two days after his arrest, on July 7, 1984, 17-year-old Ricky Casso would commit suicide by hanging himself in the Suffolk County Jail he was detained in. Jimmy Troiano would later be charged as an accomplice in the crime, but was ultimately acquitted in April of 1985, resulting in this story reaching a non-conclusive ending less than a year after it made such a splash in the press. While the story would quickly fade from the headlines, its legacy would live on. A Rolling Stone article published in November of 1984, just months after the murder and Ricky's suicide, would do a deep dive into this controversial story, but had a hard time separating the rumors and innuendo, particularly of Ricky and his alleged accomplices being a part of a satanic cult, from the reality of Northport, Long Island. This would be followed by an exploitative book in 1987, titled Say You Love Satan, which did more of the same, plagiarizing large portions of the Rolling Stone article and cementing to the public that this was indeed a murder committed by drug dealing and addicted Satanist. The story would be featured on numerous daytime talk shows, such as Geraldo Rivera's program in 1988, and has inspired countless independent filmmakers and metal musicians in the decades since. But in the nearly 40 years since the body of Gary Lowers was found in the Aztecia woods, few have bothered to question this narrative. 
that Ricky Casso was part of a secretive cult who not only dealt drugs throughout the area, but had killed Gary Lowers amidst a drug-crazed satanic ritual. This was the narrative put forth by local law enforcement at the time of Casso's arrest, when they took statements he made during his confession, made the same day as his arrest, when he was reportedly high on mescaline, at face value. Speaking to the press in July of 1984, Assistant District Attorney William Kehan would blame drugs, Satanism, and heavy metal music for the murder, telling reporters that Casso and his friends, quote, took a living, breathing 17-year-old boy as a sacrificial animal. They mutilated him, and they acted out satanic rites, unquote. The most heartbreaking part of Ricky Casso's confession was the revelation that, while stabbing 17-year-old Gary Lowers to death, he had commanded him to say you love Satan, hence the title of David St. Clair's book from 1987. As he died, Lowers reportedly told Ricky that he loved his mother, a detail that law enforcement was quick to share with the press. The media was quick to glob onto this as part of their narrative, cementing Ricky Casso as the clear-cut bad guy and Gary Lowers as the unwitting victim, ignoring the fact that both were drug-addicted high school dropouts that had known each other since grade school and had a long history together that included bouts of substance abuse, homelessness, and even the trappings of petty teenage drama. But in the rush to tell this story, all of that was forgotten by the broad strokes of drug-addicted satanic cult that listened to heavy metal music, which, amidst the satanic panic craze of the mid-1980s, overpowered the other elements of this case. In the Long Island, New York suburb of Northport, 17-year-old Richard Casso hanged himself in a jail cell over the weekend after being charged with the murder of one of his friends. Today, Casso's parents blamed the police for their son's death. They claimed he was high on mescaline when he was arrested and should have been kept under observation. Well, drugs played an important part in young Casso's life, and so apparently did the devil. As Gene Meserve reports, both played an important role in the murder he committed. Divers plumb the depths of Northport's harbor today looking for a knife. Richard Casso, 17, confessed to using it in the murder of Gary Lauer. In this clearing, Casso and a group of friends performed a bizarre ritual, stabbing Lauer, burning articles of his clothing, and cutting out his eyes. In the park where the group congregated, there is Satanistic graffiti, and Suffolk County officials believe a fascination with the devil motivated Casso. And, uh, I think you, you start with young kids that, that maybe have a, a problem themselves initially, and then you throw on top of that the drugs and the rock culture itself. Uh, I think all of this plays a part in it. Though much is being made of the cult, a lot of people here in the town of Northport don't think Satan motivated the killing. They think drugs did. To my knowledge, it was a revenge killing based on the fact that Lowers had gypped them out of ten bags of angel dust. Acquaintances say Lauer had stolen PCP from Casso, and Casso, a drug user and dealer, wanted revenge. But Satanism provided the method for the murder, if not the motive. Clinical social worker Arnold Markowitz says such an extreme is rare, but a teenage fascination with the devil is not. Uh, it's titillating to them. It's exciting. It's, it's unacceptable, so it makes it a bit rebellious. And I think that they get a charge out of the uh, excitement and the danger and the scariness of it. Casso committed suicide in his jail cell Saturday morning, but another youth has been charged and the case is generating unusual interest. Four other jurisdictions have contacted Northport authorities to relate similar incidents involving Satanism and sacrifice. In the years since this explosive story made headlines, the town of Northport has struggled to shake this reputation of being the town known for Gary Lowers and Ricky Casso. What was an incredibly personal story, touching upon several issues many of us face in our day-to-day -day lives, instead became exaggerated because of unfounded rumors and fear-mongering gossip. It really wasn't until 2018, with the publication of his book, The Acid King, that author Jesse Pollock began to return some semblance of normalcy, or sanity, to the story. Looking past the buzzword-laden headlines, Jesse spoke to dozens of people at the heart of this case, and was able to tell a story that was human for lack of a better word. After writing this book, he would go on to create a documentary of the same name with his friend, Dan Jones, 
who serves as Jesse's co-director on The Acid King. During their research, they would begin speaking to Anthony Zankis, a professor of social work at Columbia University, who grew up in the region of Northport at the time of the murder, and knew several of the individuals involved, ultimately becoming a producer for the documentary. Recently, I had the chance to sit down and chat with these three about the true story of what happened to Gary Lowers, and what inspired Ricky Casso, the self-proclaimed Acid King, to commit such a brutal crime against someone he once considered a friend. Here is Jesse explaining what he learned from his research, as well as some insights from Anthony. Ricky Casso was a teenager who grew up in suburban Northport, Long Island. He was born in 1967, uh, the son of two school teachers uh, from Suffolk County that um, taught in various schools, Northport schools, uh, Cold Spring Harbor. And by all accounts, he was your average all-American boy, got up at six in the morning to play football with his friends on, on Seaview Avenue. Um, very, very talented with a lot of things he did. He was a musician, uh, well-liked, had a good sense of humor, a lot of friends, very popular. Uh, but where the story diverted in most tellings was somewhere around junior high school, something happened. And in most of the public tellings, it was very vague for reasons we'll get into later, but that something changed and suddenly he had no interest in school anymore, no interest in sports. He began doing drugs and almost as soon as he began doing them, he began selling them um, to the point where by the time he was 16 years old, he was probably the chief supplier of hallucinogens in Northport, maybe even that area of Suffolk County, hence the nickname The Acid King. Um, and in the uh, summer of 1984, when Ricky was 17, he murdered a friend of his, Gary Lowers, who had stolen 10 bags of angel dust out of uh, Ricky's jacket pocket while he was passed out at a party. Uh, Ricky, like a lot of teenagers in the uh, early to mid-80s, was interested in horror movies and Ozzy Osbourne, Judas Priest, and like some of us do, had a, a flirtation with the occult. Um, but not, not in like the craft kind of way. He read the Satanic Bible and told friends that, you know, he was a Satanist and stuff like that, but it was, it was kid shit, you know? But once this murder happened, after uh, Gary's body was found weeks later, uh, the, the press really latched on to this whole idea that this was a satanic ritual. It was a cult killing because there were other kids there uh, present at the murder. At first, it was reported that it was up to a dozen to two dozen teenagers that were supposedly chanting in robes in front of a, a large bonfire, when in reality, it was it was four teenagers, Ricky and Gary included, in front of a little campfire in the woods, and they were doing PCP and smoking marijuana and possibly uh, maybe even drinking, and it was a fight that I, that got out of hand, and, and Ricky Casso stabbed Gary Lowers to death. But because there was that sort of spooky window dressing around it, and this kid was supposedly an occultist, and there were other people there, it got dressed up uh, by the press as a satanic sacrifice. And before Ricky could, you know, I don't know if he would have wanted to, but before he ever had the chance to set the, the record straight on trial or in an interview with the press... He very quickly uh, committed suicide by hanging himself in the Suffolk County lockup within 36 hours of being arrested and charged for Gary's murder. So, with the the chief uh, character suddenly ripped away from the story, it was this feeding frenzy by a, uh, a, a, a sensationalist media, everyone from the New York Post to the New York Daily News to, and, and Anthony can tell you all about this, Good Morning America was there, there were journalists from Japan and London uh, hiding in trees in Northport trying to get a scoop in pictures. It just became this, this very, uh, this crazy story, and in the wake of Ricky's suicide, at the center of it were the the friends and um, 
uh, other associates of Ricky's uh, acquaintances, if you will, that were left behind, and and Anthony was among that uh th- that group of friends and uh and people that that knew not just Gary but Ricky and uh, Jimmy Triano, one of the other people that was there that night who was later charged. The story that was told through the media, my God, I forgot about that. Yeah, there were reporters in trees in Northport. The BBC was there. Uh, uh, media from Japan was there because they said Satan lives in Northport, you know, but the more I heard, you know, I didn't know Ricky's backstory when I would see him downtown with his long hair looking all strung out. But what I heard over time was here was a guy who was brutally and violently demeaned and psychologically abused by his father. I did not know about the physical abuse until I spoke with Jesse and then read the the book. Um, But that uh, Ricky grew up with severe emotional abuse and absolutely that can destroy a person. There's a lot of evidence that the worst form of abuse for anybody to suffer over a period of time is emotional and psychological abuse. They've looked at serial killers and the one thing they have in common, some of them are sexually abused, some of them are physically abused, some of them are multiply abused, but the one thing that they all have in common was they were emotionally, psychologically degraded and abused on a regular basis. And That was Ricky's life from about, it seems, 13, maybe before then, but we know from about 12 or 13 until he died at 17 uh, by suicide. And, you know, one other thing, my work intersects with what Jesse was discovering because I teach about trauma and how it affects the brain. It changes the way the brain functions. So, you know, one little traumatic event can have a serious impact, but when you've got a a, a series of, you know, days, weeks, months, now years of trauma existing in somebody's life through abuse and neglect, it literally changes the way the brain functions and the way that they interact with the world around them. So... Although the murder was shocking, it is not surprising that someone like Ricky, who was so harmed by his experience growing up in his abusive family, it's not surprising that he was the one who perpetrated. And that was the big revelation, too, when I uh, was researching the book, because if you took the original media accounts at face value it was a story of like i said this all-american boy who you know oh he tried a joint in 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 junior high school and that set him off on this this path of destruction and oh his poor family just couldn't deal with him anymore when after i you know interviewed a lot of his friends and i and i i spoke with nearly 50 people while writing this book um there was a clear story emanating from all of them. It was Ricky when he became, as Anthony said, around 12 or 13, no longer wanted to play football. His father snapped. His father had great ambitions, not just for Ricky, but for all four of his children. Uh, Ricky had uh, three sisters, all of whom uh, later became very uh, talented athletes in their own right. Um, but he was very driven by this uh, prospect of athletic success for his children. Uh, He was a football coach, a wrestling coach. Um, His father before him had been a uh, minor league baseball player, Alfred Casso. Um, So there was this intense ambition for Ricky to become the next Johnny Unitas, essentially. And when it became clear to Dick Casso that his son wasn't going to, you know, allow Dick to live vicariously through him and he wasn't going to become this great football star that he hoped for him, that that Dick essentially had no use for him anymore. And there were a lot of fights within the house. Uh, and th- they culminated with 
uh, severe beatings. I spoke with a very close friend of Ricky's while writing the book, and there, there's a sequence in the documentary where I include the audio from my interview with him where he talks about, you know, if Ricky was late to football practice, his father would beat him across the back with a wooden broom. And it, it, it all got to the point where by the time Ricky was in eighth grade, his father had thrown him out of the house. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, by that point, it wasn't just because of the lack of uh, football dreams. He was also, you know, smoking pot by that point and may have been dealing by that point. Those, of course, compounded the issues. But uh, instead of taking better control of the situation, either through intervention with a, a drug counseling program or or what have you, his response was a response that was typical of a lot of parents in the uh, late 1970s and early 80s. It was one of tough love, and he basically threw Ricky out of his home, and, you know, when you're 13, 14 years old, you don't really have a whole lot of resources at your disposal, so Ricky took to sleeping in unlocked cars that he found on Main Street. Uh, at one point, he was sleeping on the floor of a public bathroom uh, at Scudder Beach, uh, to the point where he was sleeping on the forest floor inside of Aztecia Woods, which later became the crime scene for the murder of Gary Lowers. So, all of these problems at home culminated in him essentially becoming a feral child, living in the woods at, you know, such a crucial part in his life, in the, the, the beginning of his adolescence. And it really compounded the the mental illnesses that, uh, that he was experiencing at the time. One doctor uh, diagnosed him as uh, having... It's, it's now called bipolar disorder, but at the time it was referred to as manic depression. Uh, and I mean, even without that... It, you really have to wonder what it does to a child's mind knowing that your family has tossed you out like you're the, you know, you're the week's garbage and you're, you're sleeping in the goddamn woods eating stolen bologna to stay alive. And I'm not excusing what he did to Gary Lowers, but it is an understanding of it. And it makes a hell of a lot more sense than the bullshit story that was th fed through the media for over 30 years that, oh no, he was this great kid that went crazy because he smoked a joint and listened to Ozzy Osbourne. The parents, mostly the father, were controlling the narrative, especially in the wake of Ricky's suicide. And, I mean, you can't blame the journalist too much there because it's like, oh, well, this is what the family is telling us. But it became very clear that Dick Casso's abuse of his son, at least inside the confines of the village of Northport, was very well known at the time, and it was Northport's dirty little secret. Because he was, he was an upstanding citizen, he was well-liked, he was a, a, a beloved teacher and a coach, but it was the dark side of suburbia that a lot of people knew about. And at first, not a lot of people wanted to discuss it openly with me for the book, but once more and more people were giving up glimpses of it, and I was able to say, well, this is, you know, I've heard from, you know, another person I interviewed that, you know, Dick Casso threw him through a screen door and chased him down Seaview Avenue because he wouldn't get a haircut. Uh, then people would start opening up, oh, okay, someone else talked about that. Yes, I saw that. That did happen, and this is what also happened as well. So as more and more and more people became comfortable talking about the story and loosened up, the portrait became very apparent and all of these stories bolstered each other and supported each other that, okay, th this is a story of trauma and abuse that went off the rails. This isn't a story of, you know, it's, it's ridiculous what they tried making it out to be some after school special where, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's that devil's lettuce and Ozzy Osbourne to blame. After the break, we'll hear more from Jesse, Dan, and Anthony, and learn about the details of this case that never made it to the headlines. Today's episode of Unresolved is brought to you by Simply Safe. Everyone wants to keep their home and family safe, whether it's from a break in, a fire, flooding, or a medical emergency. Simply Safe Home Security delivers award winning 24 7 protection. With Simply Safe, you don't just get an arsenal of cameras and sensors. You get the best professional monitors in the business. They've got your back day and night, ready to send police, 
fire, or EMTs when you need them most straight to your door. My favorite part about Simply Safe is that they mail you everything you need, shipping it directly to your doorstep and letting you set up your own home security system. You can set everything up in about 30 minutes. You can choose which windows and doors you want covered by sensors or cameras, and then let Simply Safe monitor your home with no long term contracts or hidden fees. Right now, my listeners can get a free home security system when they purchase a Simply Safe system at simplysafe.com/unresolved. You also get a 60-day risk-free trial, so there's nothing to lose by shopping now. Visit simplysafe.com/unresolved for your free security camera and 60-day risk-free trial today. Once again, that's at simplysafe.com/unresolved. Today's episode is also brought to you by BetterHelp. Is there something that interferes with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? If so, BetterHelp Online Counseling is here for you. Connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. It's so convenient, and you can now get help on your own time and at your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist. Best of all, BetterHelp is a truly affordable option. Unresolved listeners get 10% off of their first month with the discount code UNRESOLVED. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash unresolved and fill out the introduction questionnaire to let BetterHelp assess your needs and match you up with a counselor you will love. Once again, you can redeem this offer by heading to betterhelp.com slash unresolved. That's betterhelp.com slash unresolved. Now, let's return to the show. Two things you need to know about this murder. It was not your average murder. It was a brutal no. murder. Understand that Ricky and Gary, the victim, were childhood friends since like first grade. They knew each other their whole lives. They hung out together every single day. And Ricky didn't just stab Gary to death. He stabbed him multiple times, mutilated his body, cut his eyes out with a knife, it was di a, a, a disturbing scene, then uh, laid his body on the ground and covered it up with leaves and twigs. Now, that's the first part that is important to stand out. Like, that is the uh, those are the actions of a broken person. Now, the second piece of this is more than a dozen, maybe even more than 20 kids from that town were brought up to the gravesite of their friend, Gary, who they also grew up with, by Ricky and Jimmy Triano, who was also there, to see the body. Because they didn't, most of them didn't believe it was true. You know, your high friend says, oh, I, I, I killed Frank. You're like, oh, sure you did. Well, he brought them up there and they saw it. None of them told. It wasn't until an anonymous tipster heard about the kids being shown Gary Lauer's body that authorities were finally made aware of his murder. At that point, no missing persons report had been filed for the missing teen, since he, like Ricky, had dropped out of high school and had a troubled relationship with his own family, having been living on the streets for weeks, if not months, at the time of his death. The more that I learn about this case, the more that I realize this wasn't a case of satanic ritual sacrifice or anything like that. This is the story of a handful of broken children, raised in an era during which we had very little understanding of mental illness or other behavioral issues that might have led to them having issues at school or with their family. And as Jesse points out to me during our interview, this happened in the tough love era of American suburbia, when faced with adversity, or children that were lashing out in unexplained ways. Parents would often cast them out and force them to find their own way in life. That's exactly what happened in the case of these three young men at the center of the story, Ricky Casso, Gary Lowers, and Jimmy Troiano. This part of the story never really gets explored by any of the original reporting, which was quick to label the individuals in this story as part of a drug-peddling, crazed, devil-worshipping cult, but didn't really attempt to dig into any of the reasons why these teenagers ended up living on the streets or dealing in illegal narcotics just to get by. On that, here's Anthony and Jesse. Having grown up in Northport and lived through it all, um, that's the first thing I said to Jesse on the phone is, I, you know, I want you to, to do this story justice. It's never been told. It's always bothered me that it's never been told. 
And before Jesse ever approached me, I would talk, I, you know, I teach social work at, uh, at two universities and I would talk to my students about what got me into social work. And it was this case that made me want to make a difference in the lives of kids. Um, so for a whole bunch of reasons, I said, you know, you need to tell the real story. Healing needs to happen and change needs to happen. And that can't happen if we don't name the real problem. And Jesse assured me that that's the story he wanted to tell. And I can say that after reading the book, I had an emotional response. Uh, it, it was a surreal experience for me. While reading the book, it brought me back there. And there were times I had to stop and put it down because I was getting emotional um, because I knew the kids and I knew the, the trauma that happened. But at the end of the book, I felt uh, we have finally had someone uh, do the right thing, tell the story of these disconnected, broken children and a town that uh, needed to hear the truth, but uh, a society that didn't want to tell the truth about it. And uh, I thank you so much for that, Jesse. It's a gift. The pleasure was mine. I mean, I can't really take a whole lot of credit for the, the way the book came out because it was, I took a passive role in it. It was, okay, this is an opportunity, as I mentioned before, to give these people their story back. And you would have to be a fool to hear the, the truths that these people were telling you and go, eh, well, I'm not going to use any of that. I have my own feelings about this. And that's by and large what the um, the last author that tried to tackle this case, a guy named David St. Clair, did with his book in 1987 uh, called Say You Love Satan. As I touched on at the beginning of the episode, Say You Love Satan was a book published by David St. Clair in 1987, which ended up being the definitive word on this story for the better part of three decades. Despite the book being pulled from production, amidst allegations that St. Clair had plagiarized a large part of the book and then fictionalized the rest, it has played a large part in propagating many of the myths that are forever linked to this case. One of those myths is that Ricky Casso and Gary Lowers were linked to a group of distempered youths in the region that called themselves the Knights of the Black Circle. In some tellings, this group was described as young adults that dabbled in drug dealing. In others, they were a bona fide satanic cult that regularly sacrificed animals in the region in bizarre rituals. But most reports would split the difference between the two, settling somewhere in the middle. As we'll learn, even this was a gross exaggeration. When you hear people talking about the Knights of the Black Circle in various tellings of it, it's, oh, oh, they had pentagrams on their backs and all this stuff. And <laughs> it conjures up this imagery of kids walking around either in robes or like black leather jackets when, no, they, these were fucking Canadian tuxedos here. These were, <laughs> these were, you know, as Anthony will, will tell you, these were the last of the hippies, right? Well, actually... The, the kids with the Knights of the Black Circle, they were a little different. So there was like a weird separation of, of, of cliques with circus. in Northport. Yeah. So Circus was the hippies. These are the kids that smoked weed. They were like into art and music. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the kids in the Knights of the Black Circle, a couple of them were brothers who were biracial and, um, you know, really chill guys. <coughs> they... They sold weed. They were not evil. They were not Satanists. They had uh, denim vests with somebody painted the pentagram on there for them. And they called themselves the Knights of the Black Circle. It wasn't even a gang. They didn't get in fights with people. They got people high, you know, <laughs> like. Well, the whole reason for that, too, as uh, the, the brothers you're talking about are John and Fred McCuller. And when I interviewed Johnny, John about Johnny, that, not said, Jimmy, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. And um, when I interviewed Johnny about it and I asked him, I said, well, if you guys weren't Satanists, what was up with the, the pentagrams on the back of your jackets? And he said, we were having trouble with rival dealers <laughs> from King's Park. Well, and yes. they would they would come. 
we, they would come over um, from Kings Park into East Northport and kick the shit yes! out of us and steal and steal our supply. So uh, basically, they had a, a, a quote unquote meeting in the woods, um, and one of their friends, uh, Paul McBride, um, known to many as as Cork and and King, and they, they were fans of nicknames. <laughs> these, these were. Goofy potheads, and he said, "I know what we should They're do." They're a nerd crew. We should, we yeah. They were a nerd crew, hundred percent. They they they, they put people were like, like us, D and D kids, yeah. future podcasters. And so Paul said, "I know what we should do. We should paint pentagrams on the back of our jackets and give ourselves a name, and we'll scare the shit out of these dealers from Kings Park. They'll think we're Satanists, and they'll never kick our ass again." And they they met in the woods around this old. You remember the wooden cable spools from when we were kids? Yeah. And you could flip them. You flip them over on their side, and hey, for your first apartment, you have a dining room table now. Great. <laughs> and that's what they had in the woods. It was painted black. And when the McCullers said, "What should we call ourselves?" Paul McBride said, "We'll call ourselves the Knights of the Black Circle." The black circle being a painted black cable spool they were using as a table. It wasn't satanic imagery. It was medieval. They were trying to be the knights of the round table. And the second Johnny explained that to me, it all made sense. It was like, oh my God. So this this was just like this comical um, over-exaggeration. And he goes, yeah, well, I mean, we didn't really do ourselves any favors. We really fucked ourselves over pretending to be a Satanist cult in a town where a Satan murder happened a few yeah. years later. But he was like, we did have to hide in the woods from the press for about two weeks. Unfortunately, this very human element of the story was lost in the noise surrounding the jailhouse suicide of Ricky Casso and the numerous allegations of human sacrifice as was the actual cause of the murder, which many continue to believe was tied into Ricky's visions of satanic sacrifice. While it is true that Ricky Casso was interested in the occult, this was most likely not the main motivation for him to have killed Gary Lowers. As has been reported over the past 35 years, Gary had stolen approximately $50 worth of PCP from Ricky while he was sleeping after a party, and that might have been the original impetus for the crime. But as we'll hear, the root of the issue might have been much more impulsive and tied into Ricky's tragic personal upbringing. It wasn't even about the money. Uh, Ricky had been paid back three times. Ricky beat Gary senseless on multiple occasions to be paid back. He stalked Gary at his mother's home. His mother gave him $50 and said, please leave my son alone. Scott Travia, a friend of Gary's, gave Ricky some money and said, here, you know, he, he fucked up, but let me make it right. Let me give you some cash. And the the night that he died, supposedly, Gary gave him an additional $50 towards it. It wasn't about the money. It was about his ego. It was uh, it was mm. about the fact that someone that was his friend for all those years, someone he thought he could trust, someone he liked and connected with, had stolen from him. And that bruised his ego, and because he was mentally ill, and he was addicted to mind-altering substances, and had a lot of rage and hurt in his heart because of the way that his family had casted him out. Only 48 hours before the murder happened, by the way, Ricky was told by his father, yeah. don't ever call the house ever again, don't talk to your mother, your sisters, me, anyone, here's two dollars, fuck off, we don't want anything to do with you ever again, you're dead to us. And this is a kid that is living in the woods. He is 50 pounds underweight because he is not eating. He His mind is crazed on a, a diet of PCP and LSD and anything else he can get his hands on. He has nothing to live for at this point. And he took it out on his friend because his friend made the unwise decision to humiliate him by stealing from him at a party while he was sleeping wasn't about the money it it, it was in an, an act of ego and unfortunately uh ricky paid the ultimate price for it he died you know after hanging himself in a jail cell 
Gary's family got no closure, no answers from it. Ricky's family had to deal with that trauma that was passed on to his, his sisters. And I imagine his mother, who knows what the father felt about it. And um, the generational trauma that is now being experienced through the shockwaves of the event in the town. And I know all of us sitting here right now are somewhat guilty of it because, you know, we're rehashing it again in this film 30 something years later, but we did it in the spirit of, we have to correct the record because the story that is going to serve, because the story is not going anywhere, whether we told it or not. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds of thousands of web pages devoted to the story, millions of heavy metal songs, uh, you know, comic books, you name it. Ricky Casso is a pop culture icon in certain circles. But we didn't want the final word on this story from us to just be another rehash of Satan bullshit. We wanted to say, if we're going to bring this up again, let's tell the true story so that this generation coming up in Northport and elsewhere now, when they hear about it, they can at least pick up the book or, or watch the film and go, oh, okay, there was no satanic cult. Okay, the, the murder happened, but it wasn't a sacrifice. Oh, there was a, you know, a grave robbing incident, but it, it, it was not how the press portrayed it. That's what I hope people take away from it. Um, whether they do or not, that's uh, that's ultimately on them. But I, I do hope that in some way, Dan and myself and, and Anthony, who has helped us through every step of the way, have succeeded in um, shedding some light on one of the, uh, the darkest chapters in uh, American suburban history. The documentary that Jesse and Dan co-directed, and which Anthony produced, The Acid King, is in the final stages of editing, and should be released in the months to come, as was the case with Jesse's book of the same name. This independent documentary is a great telling of the story, which does a great job of, excuse my language, cutting through the bullshit in order to tell this really human story. There was a major disconnect in this community and that was the heart of what I really wanted to get to with the book and what Dan and I wanted to get to uh, with this film because it was a much more interesting question than just being you know true crime ghouls and it's like well yeah. let's talk about how many stab wounds there are <laughs> and so let's talk about spooky satan which you know yeah. are valid yeah. talking points in the story but it doesn't bring understanding and it doesn't bring closure or or a warning to 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 show people this was not an anomaly this can happen anywhere, and it has happened anywhere, and it wasn't some random explosive moment in Northport. It had been brewing for years, and it finally boiled over that night in Estakia Woods. Mm -hmm. There, There's two sides to the story. There's the the act, like everything that happened, what the media ran with. And then there's the human side of things that people just ignore, which is kind of like, well, we've been talking about the whole time, but just to put a point on it. Um, and a lot of people ignore that part. And that's kind of what bums me out about like true crime in general. Um, people forget that there are people behind these horrible things. And I don't know. It's not so much like an insensitivity. I think it's just a disconnect. Yeah. So I think I think we portrayed that pretty well um, in in the film, not to toot my own horn or anything. Dan and Jesse have allowed me to watch an early cut of the film, which should be released on DVD, Blu-ray, and streaming services early next year. I can promise you that it is very much worth your time. Make sure to be on the lookout for that in the first half of 2021, and I'll be sure to update you all with the pending release as I learn more. I'll be releasing my entire conversation with Jesse, Dan, and Anthony on the Unresolved Patreon page. They were kind enough to spend a couple of hours talking to me about the Acid King, their experience working on the film, as well as Anthony's experience living through the events it depicts. 
and so much more. It was a great chat, which I edited down to about an hour and 30 minutes, so check it out on the podcast Patreon if you're interested. Sadly, this story remains in the same static positioning it was in back in 1984, following the suicide of Ricky Casso, because he killed himself, and the other chief players in the case were too inebriated on illicit substances at the time for their testimony to hold any merit. The events surrounding Gary Lauer's death are still surrounded in mystery. For that reason, I still consider this story very much unresolved.